And uh, good to hear in Naples and South of Florida. Uh, and uh, for the first time, good to be here. And the epistle for this Feast of the Lightning of the Lord is Sunday, Holy Name Sunday. The first Sunday of January, 2021 here. The epistle is taken with the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. In those days, Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, Ye princes of the people and ancients, hear, if, if we this day are examined concerning the good deed done to the inferred man, by what means he hath been made whole, be it known to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God hath raised from the dead, even by him this man standeth here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given to men whereby we must be saved. Then the Gospel. Take the book of St. Luke, chapter 2. At that time, after eight days were accomplished, that the child should be circumcised. His name was called Jesus, which was called by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. That's what the words of today's holy gospel. Morning, Father, the Holy Ghost, Amen. A few considerations on this sacred day of the Holy Name of our Lord. It's interesting. The Jews asked this question many times to our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do you, under whose name do you do these things? How is this man risen from the dead? No man can raise, no one can forgive sins except God alone. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Thy sins are forgiven thee, by his own name and by his own power, because he is God. And he was God, and he said, even when he's God, he even said, I come by the command of the Father. And yet they did not listen to him. God gave a special power to his apostles, which really proves the divinity. It's like a man who is a master carpenter. Is he really a great carpenter because he can make things? If he's a true master carpenter, not only is he able to make things, but he will show his greatness by teaching others who don't know how to make things, how to make things. Especially those who are incapable, those who are incompetent. If you can take an incompetent man, an incapable man, and take that man and make, make him into a master carpenter, then that master carpenter is a truly great carpenter. And our Lord Jesus Christ, by forgiving our sins, and our Lord Jesus Christ, by raising people from the dead, this was easy as him for him to do as it is for us to breathe. There's nothing special in God being God. And there's nothing special in God doing divine things, because God is God. And he is always God. St. Augustine, for St. Basil says, we consider it a great miracle that he stopped the storm. But we don't consider it a great miracle when we see that a little seed becomes an oak tree. A little seed becomes wheat and we can eat it. A little bit of seed becomes a man, becomes a plant, becomes an animal. These are miracles that happen every day. But because we see them every day, we don't see the greatness of God in these things because they are done so often. And then we see God take a storm that if he did not stop the storm, it would eventually stop on its own anyway. But he stopped the storm in the midst of the height of the storm, and we are amazed. And why are we amazed? Because it's so rarely done. Somehow, if a miracle is done every day, we, we no longer think of it as a miracle. It's no longer wonderful. Remember the Jews, 40 years in the desert, received manna from heaven, and they received quail every single day. And now it's just a greater miracle for God to feed us manna every day for 40 years than just today or just tomorrow. But over the years, what happened to the Jews? They said, I'm sick of eating manna, I'm tired of eating quail, and I'm, I'm looking for something else. And they longed for the onions of Egypt. They forgot about the stripes. They forgot about having to be being treated by such evil manner by the Egyptians. 
but they had really good onions. And they longed onions over manna. They longed for onions over quail. And God was angry with them, and hence they wandered for 40 years in the desert because of their lack of gratitude and their lack of faith and lack of confidence in God. Now we arrive only a few weeks after the crucifixion. And it says, and St. Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, He's going to say something as a man. And he is not going to speak as God because he's not God. He is another Christ. A priest is Alter Christus, another Christ. But he's not another God. He's another Christ. And he will say as another Christ, the other day I went into the temple and there was a man begging. Remember, this is only maybe two months after the crucifixion. There was a man begging after the resurrection. And he wanted money. And I said, silver and gold I have not, but what I have I give thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, arise and walk. And the man arose and he walked. And they said, under what name did you do this? A few things concerning the holy name of our Lord. First of all, let's note, that a name is most important when we are at war. A name is most important when we are in great battles. In the old days, when a man would come to the camp, what army do you belong to? Well, I belong to your army. Everybody says that. Who is your captain? Because only members of the army know the names of the captains. Who is your captain? Who is your general? Under what name do you fight? And if the man didn't know the right name, exit from the plank. Eliminate him. Under whose name do you fight? When an ambassador comes and says, I am going to I speak to you about the demands of my king. Whose name? So on this day, St. Peter is filled with the Holy Ghost. And they say, under what name did you do these things? And St. Peter says, I will tell you what name I have done these things. When Jesus Christ rose from among the dead, he said, rise. When he forgave sins, he says, forgive sins. I forgive sins because he's God. But when St. Peter does it, he is not God. Therefore, he says, silver and gold I have not, but what I have I give thee. And what do I have? What makes me priest? What makes me representative of God? What makes me powerful? The name of Jesus of Nazareth. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, arise and walk. This name he has passed on to his holy priesthood. He's passed on to St. Peter. And now he speaks in the name of Christ. Hence our Lord told him beforehand, whoever hears you, hears me. And whoever despises you, despises me. I will give you my words. They shall come out on your tongue. My blessings shall pass through your hands. So then when I was ordained a priest, the bishop put the anointing of the fingers on the hands and said, whatever these hands bless, it shall be blessed. Whatever these hands consecrate, it shall be consecrated. So that theirs are just human hands. But these hands are sanctified by holy oil, just like the whole body of Aaron was sanctified by holy oil by Moses. And now the hand can bless. And now the hand can consecrate. But why can these hands bless? Why can these hands consecrate? Because of the name of Jesus is in these hands. In the custom of Spanish countries, this custom always kiss the hand of the priest because there Jesus is found. The custom in India, that whenever you come to a priest, you always bow your head, that the priest may put the sign of the cross upon your forehead. Every person may put the sign of the cross upon the forehead. Why is that? Because Jesus is in this thumb. The name of Jesus is physically located on the planet Earth. It's the name of a man. Man is not an angel. 
Man is not a spirit alone. He has a spirit inside of him. But a man is a spirit in a body. He's a soul in a body. And the name of Jesus must be continued in this world in human flesh. In a human body. So in a little while, what shall I say? Over a little piece of bread that is unleavened. Holding between the thumb and the forefinger. This is my body. Hoc est en carpus meum. And when that mayhem was completed, at the very last moment when that mayhem was completed, the body and the blood and the soul and the divinity of he who is Jesus Christ enters into that host and the bread is gone. It's completely gone. Absent forever and never to return. God enters. His humanity of Jesus Christ enters. God the Son's there. And how did it happen? Because a human being, a man, who received the power of priesthood and the name of Jesus inside of his human flesh said, this is my body. That is the reason why the church teaches if you hit a priest, it's a mortal sin. Here's a record, by the way, if the priest is hitting you, you'll be hitting back. <laughs> But nonetheless, if you hit a priest, it's a mortal sin. You'll be excommunicated, suspended, but not receive Holy Communion. Why? Because who hits a priest hits Jesus Christ. It was interesting in the Council of Trent, it doesn't apply to the faith of the priest also. In the Council of Trent, there were two cardinals, 60, 70 year old cardinals, yelling at each other. They said, You're a Lutheran, you're a Lutheran, you're a Lutheran, you're a Lutheran. They're Lutheran, two Italians yelling at each other. Finally, one of them got so fed up, he punched the other one. And they excommunicated him. He was excommunicated. And they stopped the council because you hit a priest. Because the priest has the name of Jesus inside of him. He is a representative of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus is a name that sits inside of human flesh. Now, how does this name get expressed? How does it spread to others? It says it right in the Gospel today, or in the Acts of the Apostles. Not the Gospel of the Acts of the Apostles. And Simon Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. How did Jesus Christ come to us in the flesh? Because the Holy Ghost overshadowed the Blessed Virgin Mary. And when the Holy Ghost overshadowed the Holy Mother, God became flesh in her womb. And how does it make, become possible that God, God enters into this host? How is it possible that God passes from my mouth? Because when I say Jesus is God, it has more power than when you say exactly the same thing. Just like when our president says that God, we thank you, God, for sending your only begotten Son to redeem us. That means more than what any of us say as American citizens. When this Christmas message, President Trump said, not we Christians believe Jesus is God, but as the President of the United States, he said, we thank you, God, for sending your only begotten Son to redeem us. That speaks to heaven, and it shakes the kingdom of hell. It matters who says something. We modern people say it doesn't matter who you are. Oh, yes, it does. It matters. You ever heard of the Sixth Commandment? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Why is that a commandment? Because it matters who the girl is. It matters who the man is. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. It matters which God we worship. Do we worship Buddha? No, he's a devil. Worship Allah? No, he's a devil. Do you worship any of the Hindu gods? No, they are devils. There is only one God, and it matters who that God is. It also matters who represents him at the holy altar. Women cannot represent him at the holy altar. Only a man can. That man cannot represent him at the altar unless that man is a priest of God. It matters who says Jesus is God. 
It matters where the name of Jesus is carried. And if it must be carried by human beings, it must be carried in human flesh. And it shall be carried from the time when Jesus Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago until the time he returns to judge the living and the dead. There shall be a communication of the name. And then what does St. Peter say concerning this holy name? In those days, St. Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, Ye princes of the people and ancients, hear, if, if we this day are examined concerning the good deed done to the infirm man, by that means, by what means he hath been made whole, be it known to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, don't forget, there's guilty people, our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified by us. He was crucified by all men. He was crucified by the Jews. Our Lord Jesus Christ, whom you crucified, whom God hath raised up from the dead, even by him this man standeth here before you whole. And here St. Peter is pointing out, why is anyone healthy? Why is a baby healthy? Why are seven billion people able to walk this earth? Because God has made them whole. Without our Lord Jesus Christ, there is no healthy man on earth. And there is no removing of sickness. By the name of Jesus, this man standeth before you, and he is whole. That's the reason why he's whole. Because our St. Peter said, In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, arise and walk. And who is this Jesus Christ? This is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the head of the corner. And so that there, this is the cornerstone spoken of in the Old Testament. This, this stone is going to be that this is the cornerstone between Jew and Gentile. The only stone that can unite Jew and Gentile. The only stone that can unite all the peoples of the earth. The only one stone can unite them and hold them together, and that is the head of the corner. And this stone was rejected by you, the builders. Consider this now, 2,000 years later. Who are the builders? In the Old Testament, the builders were called the Jews. Who are the builders in the New Testament? The principal builders are called pontifex, pontifices, pontifices. Pontifex means the bridge builder. It's translated in English, bishop. The bridge builders, you the bridge builders, you the bishops, you bishops of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, just like the bridge builders of the Old Testament, which were the priests and the, and the, and the shepherds, the priests of the Old Testament, they were the pontifex. Who was the green pontifex? His name was Caiaphas. What did he do? He rejected Jesus Christ. Now we find ourselves 2,000 years later, and shock of shock, surprise of surprise, what do we find? The chief bridge builder of our Holy Roman Catholic Church rejects Jesus Christ. His name is Pope Francis. He rejects Jesus Christ. And what about all the other builders? The bishops of the dioceses throughout the world, they reject Jesus Christ. Have times changed? No, they have not. Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun and hence our new times, our difficult times. Where are the bishops and priests of the church? Where are the builders? The stone that you rejected shall become the head of the corner again. The bishops are trying to find, what does Pope Francis say? We want a communist, socialist world that's going to bring peace. What did, John, what did Paul VI say? He came to the United Nations, communist organization in New York City. It came to the United Nations. And what did he say? You are the last hope of peace. The Pope says to the enemies of God, you are the last hope of peace. He rejected the cornerstone. And the bishops say, we must have global peace by social programs without Christ. And by religious liberty and by ecumenism and by all the errors of our modern world. But no, no following of Jesus Christ. No returning to the cornerstone. That stone is rejected. 
And what did St. Peter say? The stone which you rejected has become the head of a corner. How did it get there? Who put it there? It came there. It just came there. In India, there was a church. They were building in Goa in honor of uh, the, the sacred heart of some saint. I forget the name of the saint. But they were building that church. And they laid the stones back in the 1600s. They laid the stones. And as they built the wall, they went, at, they went to bed at night. In the morning, the wall would fall down. And they built it again, and it collapsed. They built it again, and it collapsed. And finally, they said, let's bring St. Anthony. St. Anthony solved the problem. They took St. Anthony, and they put him in the middle of the church construction. And the next morning, the statue of St. Anthony had a snake twisted inside of his hands. And that snake is still there. And they decided that this church is going to become the church of St. Anthony. They changed the name of the church. And they built the church, and it still stands. And seeing that statue with that snake still tied inside the hands of Anthony. The statue never moved, but the statue has a snake squeezed inside of it because Anthony destroyed that snake. Because there are two names. There is a name of Jesus, and there is a name of Lucifer. And he has many names because he's a liar. He is called Beelzebub. He is called Lucifer. He is called, he is called the Satan. Satanas. He has so many names. And they are all lies. Our king, our God, the true God, he has one name. Under which all flesh must be saved. Notice how St. Peter says it. Many people don't want to be saved. They don't want God to save them. One example was Saul of Tarsus. He did not want to be saved. He did not want to know, love, and serve God. He rejected him, and he was about to destroy his kingdom. And he dedicated himself to bringing the kingdom of God to an end. But he got knocked off his horse. He was made blind. And then the Lord Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he asked the great question, Who, Lord? Who am I persecuting? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. He heard the name of Jesus spoken by Christ himself. And then our Lord told him, it's hard to kick against the goal. You've got a hot temper. You've got a lot of pride. You're a really tough guy. But try kicking against the whip. All you get is air. You kick against the whip. All you get is air. You can kick all you want. You cannot stop my will. You cannot stop my way. So change your allegiance. You are now a follower of the name of Satan, the name of Beelzebub. You are now a follower of that one. Change your name and the name that you follow. And so he did. And he became the greatest of all the apostles. For the remainder of his days, he carried the name of Jesus in his flesh. And he is the one who carries that name in his 14 epistles. He carries that name to the ends of the earth. He brings about the conversion of the Gentiles. Now, how does he do this? By carrying the name of our king and master inside of himself. It does matter under what name I operate. Matters what name I communicate. And it must be in human flesh that it is communicated. It must be in human flesh that the name of Jesus rules. God can kill all his enemies in a moment. Remember what he told St. Peter on Holy Thursday night. Put up thy sword, Simon Peter. Put up thy sword, Peter. Do you not know that I could kill all these in one moment, call a legion of army of angels and destroy them? No, that's not what I want right now. Put up thy sword. What St. Peter didn't understand is that on that night, Jesus Christ, was training Peter to be a priest. He was training him to feed the lambs, to feed the lambs and feed the sheep. You see, he learned his education during the three and a half years of his seminary training. 
But now he needed a cross. Now he needed tears. Now he needed to see how weak he was. Now he needed to realize that though he was very brave, and St. Peter was very brave, he wasn't brave enough to fight for Christ. And he wasn't strong enough to fight the devil. Therefore, put not confidence in your own strength, put not confidence in your own power, but let the name of Jesus enter into your flesh. Only a few hours ago I said, this is my body, this is my blood. And I gave you my body and I gave you my blood. And with my body and blood inside of you, you reach for a wimpy sword. It's like with a water pistol when you got a nuclear bomb. Don't reach for the water pistol, just nuke them all. This is not the time for such things. Don't reach for the small weapon. Reach for the great weapon. The name of Jesus defeats Satan. But how does it defeat Satan when that name is in my flesh, when that name is in my tongue, when that name is in my heart? Now when Joshua, which is the same name as Jesus, when he crossed that river Jordan, he walked across it on dry land. But he had a more difficult task than Moses did. Moses walked across the Red Sea, and the bad guys were on the other side. And when they went into the Red Sea, they were all dead. But Joshua was a great warrior. And the word Joshua is the same as Jesus. The only difference is the spelling. Yeshua. And Yeshua is the Savior. He left the safe side of the river where there were no enemy. He parted the river and he went with the priests and the Ark of the Covenant in the center of the river. He came out the other side. They built this big stone pile of rocks to come right to the place where they crossed. They all crossed the river and the river then flowed again and there's no retreat. He was a bit like the great, great Catholic Cortez. He wanted to conquer Mexico. He went into Mexico City and he saw them doing great human sacrifices. Fernando Cortez. He had 400 soldiers against only a few million. They were afraid and wanted to retreat. He said, no problem. So he went back to his ships and he burnt them. He destroyed the ships. He says, now, you've got two choices. Conquer this land or die. It's up to you. I don't really care. I'm conquering this land. And they said, we're going to conquer this land. He took away his retreat. And that is what Joshua did when he crossed that river. He crossed the river from the safe side to the unsafe side. The side where there were no enemies to the side where there was nothing but enemies. And they crossed into that side. And then he had to conquer the city of Jericho. And he had to conquer the land of all the Canaanites. He had to fight against all their, there were two great sins of the Canaanites. They were immersed in impurity and lust. And they had child sacrifice. Guess what we have today? Child sacrifice, which is called abortion. And everyone immersed in all the sins of lust. We are now in the world of the Canaanites. And in this world, Joshua came. And he had work to do. The Savior came into a world that really needed the Savior. And so it is in our times. And in the first great battle, he showed how to defeat the enemies of Satan, enemies of God. How to defeat Satan. He sent spies ahead. And it's interesting about those spies, because Moses sent spies ahead. And when they saw all the enemies inside the land of Israel, the Canaanites, they, couldn't, they were discouraged. They thought there were too many of them. Joshua was one of the spies. He didn't see it that way. He saw the land given to them by God. God punished the other Jews because they listened to the ten and they didn't listen to Joshua. But then he sent spies. These spies went into the city of Jericho and they went inside that city. And when they arrived inside, they became discovered and they escaped to a house of a prostitute named Rahab. And they said, hide us. And it's interesting how the spies said, hide us. Later on, Elias, the prophet, would come to a woman of Sarepta and say, I am hungry. And she said, I only have one bowl of porridge left. I only have one bowl of porridge left. I'm going to eat it, and my son is going to eat it, and then we're going to die. And, and Elias said, that's really nice, but I told you, I'm hungry. I am the prophet of God. 
I represent God, and I'm hungry. Give me of your porridge. And I will tell you this. If you feed the prophet of God before you feed yourself, this porridge shall never run out. You shall survive the entire of this tea of this three years of terrible famine that is killing so many in Israel. And she listened to him, and she believed, and she gave the prophet of God to eat. And then she was saved. There was a test for Rahab. And Rahab said to the spies, I saw you walking around this city. I see your people. You are of God, and we are of the devil. We have confidence in our armies and our high walls, but you have God. I don't want to make a deal with you, which is what any prostitute always does, makes a deal. So she made a deal. I will save you on the condition that you tell Joshua and you tell your God that anyone in my house shall not be harmed on the day that God destroys this city. And so the spies, when they went out and spied, they didn't just look at the land. They brought souls to God. And Rahab became the great-great-grandmother of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there was a great conversion. And everyone inside of her house, they were all saved because they were with her. And so that we are, we, we, he, she switched sides from the name of the Jericho to the name of Christ. And she did it before the battle. Not after the waters came down the flood, but before the battle. She said, I am going to join the side of the camp of the Jews, because that's the camp of God. And I'm going to leave the camp of a proud city, which is going to be killed in its pride. The same is true of the present situation in the world today. The name of Jesus is the only name on which any flesh, in all flesh, must be saved. Many flesh don't believe that he can be saved. Some are asking for it. Doesn't matter. All flesh must be saved and can only be saved by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, which must be carried in human hands, in a human tongue, in human flesh. He demanded that those Jews walk for seven days around that city of Jericho. He demanded that they walk seven times in the last day. He demanded that they cry out with a loud voice as the trumpets blew, and then the walls fell by the power of God, and not their voices, only in that they were obedient to God. And so in our times also, we must be obedient to God and recognize in the 21st century, in the year 2021, as it's just begun, that the only solution to every trouble in our world is found in the name of Jesus. That name under which every knee in heaven, on earth, and under the earth bows. It is the name of a warrior who comes to conquer a land that is filled with the devil and bring this land into the dominion of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, and to bring peace into this land, which is only the peace of heaven that matters. I, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. Not as the world gives. My peace I give unto you, and this is the peace that we want. Well, this holy name of Jesus, remember it's the name of a warrior, it's the name of one who comes to conquer. It's the name that really matters in battle. And what is the key to a soldier in battle? Soldier undergo great discipline in boot camp. Why is that? So that when the time the bullets are flying, they shall not fear bullets. As General Patton said, I teach my soldiers. Make them fear me more than death. Make them fear me more than the enemy. So that when I tell them to charge, their worry is, where does he want me to charge? Not a few million machine gun nests. Who cares about that? Do we fear God more than the enemy? Do we fear a lie more than the assaults of the devil? What do we fear? It matters in war. What is our fear? We have to decide, what do I fear? Do I fear to offend God? Or do I fear to offend the government? Do I fear to offend God and his kingdom or the world and what it demands of me? What do I fear? And the soldier must decide before he goes to battle what he fears. And then he goes for his goal. And that is to carry the name of his king, the name of his master, to the ends of the earth. And let us ask the grace to carry the name of Jesus in our hearts, 
in our souls, in our, in our entire being, to the ends of the earth, where he must reign in human flesh to the very ends of this world. Thank you, Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.